Okay. But we hear you fine, and we got you logged, uh, queued up, ready to go. So. Perfect. But he can see the slides, though, right? I've got the copy you sent, John, so I'll just run with those. It's uh, fine. Uh, Ch uh, Joseph, who's controlling the the slides? As they I am. Move? I am. Okay. So you saw the timeline. Um, just try to keep that. Um, yeah. Chris, just small change. I'm just gonna I'm gonna do the introduction. It's just gonna be Chris Marinak, Director of Research, Jenny Montgomery Scott. You're gonna go first. So okay. just switch that around. Yep. Um, you just keep little... it the five minutes to your point, right, John? Yeah, I mean it's you know, six minutes, not the end of the world. But no, it's fine. I'm just gonna have a, a cognizance of the uh, time. So it's cool. All right, Jason's logging on, so it's one minute. All right. Excellent. <clears throat> Are you able to get the cameras, or is it just the screen? Oh, good. That's a new fun toy. Well, what yeah, what time do you start these? Like two minutes after? Or what do you guys usually do? No, we st uh, well, we like to start right at the top of the hour. We rock and roll. Okay. We don't like to wait. It's your call. Well, make sure Jason's on. Yeah, we've, we've trained our people. We start right at the top of the hour. You know, I, I hate logging into a webinar and say, well, we're going to wait five minutes for other people to join us. Well, I'm here. <laughs> Let's go. Cool. All right, gentlemen, 30 seconds. Well, wait a second. The job wait, till Jason. wait till Jason logs on. Okay. There he is. No, he's, he's just right here. Uh, Jason, one change. I'm just going to introduce, I'm just going to do the introductions. I'm just going to read everyone's name. You know, just wave, say hi, and um, I'll go right to Chris for the overview. Chris, you can see everybody's, you can see the video and the screen, everything on the screen, correct? No, I cannot see a thing, John, so I'm just going to listen, and uh, I will do my, my part and I'll answer the question, so I'll just be on this live line. Okay, perfect. John, how do you want to handle questions? you want to do it at the end of every speaker, or you want to do it at the end of the presentation? Yeah, so in the script. Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, I'm Bob Coleman, publisher of the Coleman Report. I'm pleased to host this webinar for John Winnick, Clark Street Capital, CEO, um, expert in 
managing bank <laughs> liquidity. John, I've known you for a number of years. This is an awesome pr presentation you put together. Just want to go through some logistics for those of you who are new to this platform. Ask questions. You can do it through the chat box. You can send an email to joseph at comanreport.com and we will get your questions answered in the end. If we don't get to them, we'll, we'll be happy to get them to you after the presentation. Uh, this, red, this webinar is being recorded. It's being live streamed on YouTube and we'll also have a recording available afterwards if you'd like to send it to one of your colleagues. And with that, John, I'm gonna stop talking and turn it over to you. You've put together a great crowd um, uh, and, and, and a great set of panelists. So, uh, John, Global Banking Crisis 2.0. Hopefully there won't be a 3.0. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Bob. Uh, just wanna do brief introductions. We have Jason Kuyama, shareholder Godfrey and Khan. We have Edward Hida, Senior Executive Advisor, Secure Isaac Group, uh, recently retired from 30 years at Deloitte. Uh, he's replacing Bill Isaac, who had a conflict. And uh, to start off, we're gonna turn it over to Chris Marinak, Director of Research <clears throat> of Jenny Montgomery Scott. Chris, take it away. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everybody. We appreciate everyone's time. I'll spend a few minutes here just talking about the uh, State of the Union from the bank perspective. I've covered banks since 1992, and um, this is uh, maybe my fourth or fifth crisis, but nonetheless, uh, here we are. So as many of you know, um, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank back on the 10th of March, Friday, March 10th, was related to the company having a huge outflow of deposits, approximately 24% of their deposits that came out in one single day, the day before, they were unable to open. The FDIC became receiver, and uh, the bank has uh, was failed that day. And that was followed on Sunday evening, the 12th, with a second failure of Signature Bank New York, um, which, of course, um, created a, uh, a whole host of market turmoil in all uh, different angles, both in equities, fixed income, and other instruments uh, in the days since then. I'd like to think it's a little calmer uh, now than it was a few weeks uh, or a few days ago, but uh, it's very, um, I think, uh, hour to hour. And uh, the Fed announcement today uh, here in the next hour and a half also looms large uh, with how the markets perceive all of this. Um, certainly, if you go back to the issues at play, um, I think there has been a crisis of confidence. That crisis of confidence has to do with not only deposits and deposits insurance, but really just the core of Silicon Valley's issue, which is that they had a, a bunch of excess cash and they invested those into treasury securities and some mortgage-backed securities, and they had available for sale and held to maturity, and they had a fair amount of losses that were unrealized because of interest rates, not because of credit, but because of interest rates. And so effectively, the company was underwater. And if you truly marked their capital to market, both at the end of December as well as here in early March, um, they were um, they were very poorly capitalized. In fact, I would say that their capital ratios from a um, FDIC tier one perspective would have been around one percent, give or take a few basis points, and certainly way below the um, the well capitalized uh, minimum of five and, and the normal of uh, of eight percent that we like to see companies have. Um, the company in the history of Silicon Valley is that it's been a big investor in securities for years. Um, among the uh, information that I uh, have shared uh, today is that um, going back to as recently as uh, or as long ago as 2009 and 10, the company had a big position in securities, and that simply grew as the company grew. The company's assets grew a lot, particularly in the 2019-2020 era, and then with the external changes in deposits in the system because FDIC deposits grew about four. 40% from the end of 19 to um, March of 2022, that 40% increase led to big increases of deposits. And of course, Silicon Valley, as many of you know, large deposits, about a million to average account size, that uh, a, a lot of those were uninsured. They had a lot of venture capital funds. And when everybody decided to panic at the same time on the uh, morning uh, of the 9th of March, everything moved quickly. Banks are levered 12 to one. Banks have a dollar of equity and $12 of assets, and they are not designed to have all the deposits leave quickly, particularly 24% or 42 $2 billion in a matter of hours. That was why the bank failed. And then you've had all the contagion issues that have come with that in the marketplace. 
since then, including Signature Bank, which, let's face it, was part of the crypto ecosystem. The crypto ecosystem has been under fire because of the fraud at FTX for the last uh, several months, and I think that played a huge role into why that particular company was failed. Happy to address that more in Q&A, but I think we have to connect the dots on that and be honest with uh, you know why that company uh, failed and was not allowed to stay in the game. Um, where we are going forward is that I think everything has changed from the financial community. I think we are now looking at um, having mark-to-market losses marked against capital, whether it is available for sale or whether it's held to maturity. That is something that I've been doing now for the past uh, 12 or so days. And you know, we look at the world differently than we did, and part of it is capital. I think understanding where banks are going to go with capital is important. And as I mentioned, this is related to, to interest rate risk and not credit risk. Most of the securities that banks hold in the country, whether they're large banks, small banks, or in between, tend to be government securities, agency, mortgage backs, very few esoteric things. There tends to be some bank sub debt, some CMBS that banks hold, but those tend to be a very small percentage, generally 10% or less, of a bank's portfolio. Portfolio. The other 90 plus percent tends to be government and agency related instruments. They are secure. They have very good credit quality. They should come back at par. Every bank has natural amortization as well as some scheduled maturity of their dep- of their their securities in the next 12, 18, 24 months. And getting an understanding of that is where we are going. That's what our request is that we think companies are going to improve disclosures immediately starting in the month of April with first quarter earnings. Some of those disclosures are going to go back to deposits, what is uninsured, um, what is FDIC insured, what are your deposit concentrations. We're going to get real granular, real fast on deposits. And then along the way, we're going to talk more openly about what exactly banks not only hold in their securities, but it's more about how those mature those securities are maturing and amortizing. Most of the mortgage-backed securities for cent a year it just depends on the book and how long they have gone out. Um, but those are all coming back. And when that's the portion comes back, they come back at par. So we think that the combination of understanding where the um, natural interest rate marks are at March 31st, plus a better understanding of amortization allows banks to talk about this is what our, our true hole is in terms of capital. And then we can address whether banks have to raise or simply earn through the cycle to cover that difference. Again, it's different than a credit environment that we would have seen in 2008 and 9, but it is still nonetheless a hole that is perceived in the marketplace and it all ties back to confidence. So let me pause there, pass it back to John. I will be here for the Q&A session and happy to go into further details along with our colleagues on today's call. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, If you could pull up my slides. So obviously, um, wanted to just update you on what is the latest and greatest with respect to SVP, Signature, and others. Um, We learned on Monday that Flagstar New York Community Bank has acquired essentially all the deposits of Signature Bank, all but $4 billion. Um, One thing that was interesting is of the entire loan portfolio, the FDIC was only able to get uh, New York Community Bank to assume about 15% of the loan portfolio. So by any measure, it seems like uh, New York Community Bank, Flagstar, cherry picked the portfolio. And you could see they purchased 12.9 billion in loans at 79 cents a dollar. FDIC retained uh, 60 billion. With respect to Silicon Valley Bank, uh, bids are due today on essentially the private bank of Silicon Valley Bank. And they're due Friday for basically the rest of Silicon Valley uh, Bridge Bank. Uh, the hope for the FDIC is to get someone to acquire all the deposits uh, or most of the deposits and as many loans as possible. Um, to give you an idea of how rare it is for a bank to close without a buyer for the deposits, as in this case, you had a Bridge Bank. Um, the last time this happened was September 2013. This was a $25 million bank in Connecticut. Um, One message that is not getting out there is uninsured depositors rarely lose money. Even the event of bank failure, typically an acquiring institution is happy to take on the low cost funding. Uh, We also learned earlier this week that uh, Credit Suisse acquired 
uh, was acquired by UBS in a $3.2 billion deal. Uh, it also wiped out $17 billion in bondholders, which uh, wasn't very good for market confidence. And now the kind of latest on First Republic, uh, initially a consortium of banks injected $30 billion into deposits. Now the chatter is they're gonna convert those deposits to capital or at least some of those into capital. Um, but you can see the uninsured deposits by bank. Um, you know, note that these are some fairly large institutions. Um, you know, BNY Mellon, 97% of their deposits are uninsured. So there's a total of, I believe, 8 trillion of uninsured deposits in the whole system. Next slide, please. Um, as far as uh, what the government's doing, um, I did have a funny GIF with Will Farrell from old school, which I was advised not to share because he was in his underwear. Um, but you could see um, there's this effort to make people calm down. And the simple act of making people calm down uh, is sometimes creating more challenges um, because people are, are wondering, well, you know, why the need for all this? Um, last Sunday, March 14th, all obligations of the, of the bridge banks were backed by the FDIC and the deposit insurance fund. Um, and then the big move was this creation of the new bank term funding program. Uh, we'll get to that later. And there's been chatter as of today that the, there is discussions to potentially insure all deposits in the banking system, um, all $8 trillion of uninsured deposits or simply raising the cap the, the, the federal regulators may be able to do that with congressional approval. Um, they're, they're talking about that now. Uh, I know the CBAI came out against it, so this is a, a bit controversial, but uh, certainly it's something they're looking at. Finally, um, respect to asset quality. Uh, next slide. Asset quality at banks is at uh, record low levels as far as uh, NPAs. I gave you a, on this slide a couple of important dates. Um, as of Q4 2022, there's only 204 million, sorry, 204 billion of problem assets throughout the banking system. That works out to 0.39% of, of all assets. If you go back to a normal time, say Q4 2014, you could see that non-performing assets were about three times what they are now. And if you go back to the peak of non-performing assets, uh, that would be 2010. Uh, be a fairly dramatic 20-fold increase in non-performing assets to get up to those levels. So the good news is banks are sitting on very low levels of non-performing assets. Credit quality right now is clean. Having said that, it's expected to get worse. We're seeing some cracks in subprime auto loans. Uh, the special servicing rate on CMBS deals continues to rise. 44% of all new special servicing loans are on office properties. You know, from our client's perspective, um, they're worried about office, senior housing, small business loans, and small business CRA loans um, seems to be the topic. With that, uh, let me start with our first question. Um, this is for Jason and Annette. Um, why do you think there's a sudden crisis of confidence in the U.S. banking market? Maybe I'll go. I, I think. Um... You know, we really need to look back at kind of how this all went down. And, um, you know, I think Chris outlined a lot of facts there, but, um, you know, there was a erosion in um, value in the investment portfolio. The rating agency was monitoring that and had warned uh, management at SVB that, um, you know, there's a potential rating downgrade. And uh, they uh, took action and were uh, embarking on a capital raise. However, that capital raise was ultimately unsuccessful and a lot of the communications around that capital raise um, were frankly botched. And uh, rather than raising confidence in the institution, it actually had the opposite effect and caused um, many of their large customers to um, lose confidence in the institution. And um, I think there was a pivotal you know, conference call um, where uh, much of that went down. And given the concentration of their uh, customers with, um, with startups and uh, notably uh, venture capital based firms, the uh, senior venture capital leaders um, uh, really um, didn't like what was happening 
and um, advise their portfolio companies to get out rapidly. And that, that's really akin to um, yelling fire in a crowded theater. And so everybody, everybody rushes for the exit um, and um, you know, they, they wanna get out. Um, and then you know, when they're in the process of doing that, they're looking at, well, where can we put our deposits, our assets now? And uh, the same thing that they were concerned about at SVB relative to investment portfolios, um, unrealized losses, they started using that as um, a bit of a gauge, if you will, to look at other institutions. And so um, then scrutiny spread beyond SVB to other institutions, regionals, um, you know, some of the uh, perhaps larger communities, banks, others, in terms of what's their proportion of unrealized losses. And um, not only do those institutions not um, enjoy any um, increased deposits, but they um, became subject to deposit outflows as well. And so then you're starting to see, you know, a contagion effect where it spreads over from the initial institution to um, broader institutions that, um, you know, others are looking at. And I think a lot of this, um, you know, talked about the role of the VCs, but, you know, certainly the role of uh, Twitter and social media um, needs to be mentioned here in terms of the speed of that bank run and the amount of um, assets, you know, deposits uh, withdrawn, uh, you know, in a, a single business day, you know, certainly is um, remarkable, you know, compared to any previous events and the, the rapidity of that. And frankly, even the fact that the uh, regulators needed to intervene uh, during business hours, typically uh, institutions are um, rescued, you know, on a Saturday or during the weekend and there's time, you know, markets are closed. Um, it was so acute that they needed to take action immediately. And so there, there's other things I think we can get into, but I think a lot of it stems from how this event unfolded and then the cascading effect it had to other institutions. Yeah, John, you know, I, I think that the, uh, that the crisis, as you call it, has actually calmed down a bit, especially in the, the, the large community to, to small community bank sector. Um, you know, I, I, I can't see the list of attendees, but I would posit that most of the attendees, you know, on this call are, are banks or bankers. You know, I don't know that the general public understood capital versus liquidity when they were deciding on what bank to bank with and when they were doing their business with a bank uh, the way that a banker does. And, and I, I'm not trying to offend anybody if they're, if, if, uh, they're a non-banker here on the call, um, but I'm not sure they understood that. And then you, you put that in light of the recency of experience with the Great Recession from 2008 to 2010, and you can understand why the public might be a little jumpy when they hear, oh, there's a banking crisis, there's a banking problem. And I think, you know, I'm not going to echo everything that, that Ed said, because I think everything he said is, is 100% correct. But, but what I'll, I'll highlight on what he said is, you take that general idea and lack of understanding on how a bank's balance sheet works, and you spread that into uh, a world, the startup world, that is generally tech savvy, very tech reliant, and you, you layer in Twitter and the explosion of information that pervaded into that community. And then layer in that this one particular bank happened to focus their business on that on that industry. I think it's easy to understand how that sort of imploded. And did it create a crisis? Yeah, I think it did. Um, but I think that's largely been tamped down as people start to understand that this is not a capital crisis; it's a liquidity crisis, and that the money is generally there as long as you don't all want it on the same day. So I, I think it's tamped down a little bit. We have a poll question with respect to what Jason just said with deposits. Let's bring it up. This month, has your institution added deposits significantly? Added deposits, deposits modestly, little, no change. Lost deposits modestly, lost deposits significantly. From the audience's standpoint, 52% um, said little to no change. Uh, only 2% said they lost deposits significantly. Uh, Chris, your experience with the regional banks, uh, what are you seeing on the deposit side? Is, has, has the uh, outflows uh, slowed down? 
I think they have. And in fact, John, I, I think that as we finish the month, we're going to find that the outflows for your reported on television and media and social media have been you know, grossly overstated. I think the outflows are a lot less. We have one regional bank that's in my backyard. I live in Atlanta, and this is a southeastern bank that actually is reporting positive inflows. Um, we think a lot of businesses are opening multiple accounts, moving money around, really just to sort of have a better defense of the FDSC $250,000 rule. And some of this is basic stuff, like they have a million dollars, so they're opening three accounts, some of which might be at the same bank, but just trying to spread those around. I think on the back end of this, you'll see a lot of uh, customers, uh, particularly in the small business and, and medium-sized business communities, will have multiple bank relationships, which is not all a bad thing. It's not all going to be at Bank of America. It'll be at a lot of regional and, frankly, mid and community banks, too. I think it'll get spread. Uh, but right now, no one believes that, and that's the you know sort of part of the, the issue of confidence confidence that uh, we've all discussed. John, you know, John, just real quick, one thing, and we don't have time to get into the granularity of it, but I'd be interested to see how many, uh, you know, of community banks were little to no change. I think a lot of the community banks, they tend not to have depositors that are depositing 20 to $30 million in a single account. Um, and a vast majority of their deposits are insured deposits. And so, you know, it goes back to my earlier point that this crisis of of confidence in banking, I think, might be more skewed to to these large regionals and not necessarily hitting the communities, so they didn't have the deposit inflows or outflows. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, at the end of the day, it, there's about 20 banks that are on the hit list, if you will, that are being talked about in social media, that are seeing activity. For the vast majority of the 4,000 plus banks, credit unions, uh, it's business as usual. Um, now, Ed, there's some chatter, uh, talked about it earlier, about the Fed guaranteeing all deposits. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, I, I think, you know, what we've been talking about um, throughout here is, is confidence. And, um, you know, as, as a significant part of that, um, depositor confidence and their confidence that, you know, their bank is um, safe, if you will, and they don't have to worry. They don't have to pull their deposits and and run. You know, encourage a run. So, um, you know, if you look at what happened, um, you know, from a, a regulator side, you know, on, on the Friday, you know, the uh, SVB was taken over. On a Sunday, um, you know, they announced that um, all depositors, meaning uninsured depositors, would be covered. And the the way they got to that was via something called the systemic uh, risk exemption which allows um, the uh, federal regulators in, in a time of crisis to determine that if that bank was systemic, that um, its deposit should be covered to um, promote financial stability. Now, the interesting thing is that um, by the written rules, if you will, that came about um, through Dodd-Frank and were subsequently amended in uh, 2018, um, neither um, SVB, um, uh, nor signature qualified as being systemic. That threshold was raised to 250 billion. Um, SVB, as we know, was around 200 billion, and signature was around 100 billion. And in fact, um, that same day, earlier that day, Sheila Bear, former chairman of the FDIC, said that uh, she didn't believe it was justifiable to uh, deem those banks systemic. So you, you've got an interesting situation where, uh, due to the um, the crisis, the exigency of that situation in, in the heat of the battle, um, those banks are determined to be systemic and therefore the deposits covered. Um, however, you know, it sort of goes against uh, existing uh, legislation and regulatory guidance. And in fact, probably, you know, many views of others. So my, my, my whole point of this is, I think that actually, actually creates some uncertainty. And, and so where is that threshold? And now we have an implicit threshold of is it is it 200 billion like SVB is it 100 billion like Signature does it depend on the concentration of the depositors does it depend on how many uninsured does it depend um, what type of uh, depositors there are a lot of unanswered questions um, and there's, there's been some uh, speechifying if you will uh, by regulators that you know not to worry deposits are safe. Um, you know, so it's an unsettled environment. It's actually increased um, uncertainty as opposed to decreasing uncertainty. We recently saw the uh, Midsize uh, Bankers Coalition uh, came out with a proposal that um, all deposits should be 
uh, guaranteed. I, I, there's a little bit of support from what I can tell on that, but um, it doesn't seem um, universal, if you will. So that, that's kind of an open question on, you know, what happens with that. Um, I will say, you know, one, one thing we saw during the crisis, there was a program uh, that was um, put in place called the Temporary Account Guarantee Program. And that actually guaranteed um, all uninsured um, depositors. And um, what it did do was through a, a program, not an ad hoc action, through a program, it provided regulatory clarity. And additionally, it was fully charged for. And that program during the entirety of the crisis um, didn't lose any money uh, for the deposit insurance fund, didn't lose any money for taxpayers, and actually earned a profit um, for the deposit insurance fund. So I think there could be a way to do that. It, it seems that we're not there yet, but if it would be done, I, I would suggest that um, it be done in a programmatic way uh, that instills uh, confidence and certainty as opposed to taking ad hoc um, actions, which I believe do the opposite. Yeah, so uh, as, as Chris mentioned, I think in an hour, the Fed is gonna meet and uh, potentially raise interest rates. Um, you know, the Fed has its own balancing act between continuing to raise rates to tame inflation while also um, dealing with the banking problems created by the rate hikes. Um, you know, my view is I think they're gonna proceed. Um, maybe it's only a quarter. I do think that inflation is still a serious issue. And I think for the Fed to not finish the job on inflation would be a mistake. Um, but we'll see. Um, Chris, Jason, what do you guys think? You think they're going to raise rates today or, or pause? Yeah, John, this is Chris. I, I absolutely think they will do 25 basis points. I'll be surprised if they don't. Um, inflation really is a real thing. And just a really quick story, I'm involved in a not-for-profit in Atlanta, and we were doing a construction project. And you know, we just had some renewed uh, pricing uh, back on March 10th of all days, and uh, that uh, is 6% higher now than it was at the end of October. So inflation is still uh, a thing, particularly for construction goods. I do think it's going to get better, but it has not gone down. And that's just one example. Everyone on the call has their own examples that they can uh, relate to. And it's still expensive to, to do things and live and travel, et cetera. And I think the Fed is still trying to fight that battle. Yeah, John, you know, sorry. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, you know, they've raised, what, 450 bips in, in about a year. Um, and whether they say it or not, I, I think the Fed's following the Taylor curve, which necessarily implies that they're going to continue raising it, on, you know, until they've at least gotten close to this inflation rate. Um, I, I don't think they can do zero. If they do zero, it's sort of an indication to the world out there that, hey, we've solved inflation, which everybody knows is not, not the case. Um, the question in my mind is, do they do 50? Now, I think 25 is the obvious bet uh, because it's sort of the, the middle of the road. Um, 50 would signal, in my opinion, that the Fed believes that the programs they have just instituted have given the confidence back to uh, you know, customers of banks and the banking sector that we have protected banks. These are illusory losses in their securities portfolios. The liquidity is, is there as long as there's no run on the bank. It's a safe and sound banking sector, and we can do 50. I think it's aggressive to say they're going to do 50, but it would be an absolute vote of confidence in themselves if they did. Yeah. Well, this bank term funding, funding program, I was talking to the CEO, sorry, chief credit officer of a $3 billion bank in Chicago a few days ago. I said, well, what do you think of this bank term funding program? And he basically said it was outstanding. Um, it is attractive relative to FHLB and other borrowings. Um, they're actually gonna move some of their funding over this program. Um, I suspect that, the, that there'll be folks who will publicly uh, not speak up about this program, but will privately use it. On that note, um, we have a poll question uh, with respect to the bank term funding program. Please only answer this question if you're working at a financial institution. How does your institution view the bank term funding program created recently by the Fed? We have used the program. We intend to use the program. We are undecided or we do not plan on using the program. Doesn't surprise me. 
Jason, you have some thoughts on this. Well, you know, and I'm sure Ed does too, but uh, so I'll be brief, but um, you know, the, uh, it, the, the problem with this program, in my opinion, is really twofold. It's a limited type of collateral that you can use versus the normal uh, Fed discount window. It's also at a higher rate. Today, I looked, it's 488 versus 475. I realize it's not, not huge, but when you're talking about a large uh, borrowing, it, it can be. Um, you know, I, I anticipate, I, I know just following statistics that I think there's a very low usage rate right now. And I anticipate it will be, continue to be a very low usage rate for a number of reasons. You know, the, 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 the Fed discount window is really meant to be a short-term borrowing to solve a short-term liquidity issue. Um, you know, instituting a program that lasts a full year is problematic for a number of reasons. I know we're going to get into M&A later. It's problematic for a number of reasons. Number one is you're borrowing at par. So you're already underwater on that loan, theoretically. And then you might stretch it out a year at 488 because you locked, it doesn't float. So you locked the day you borrow, you're locked. And then you have to pay back plus interest using what? You're not, you can't just use your, your pledge collateral because it's already underwater. And if the Fed continues to follow its increases, those securities will be even further underwater. So you're creating a, a bigger gap. And I think a lot of um, you know, banks are pretty savvy at, you know, and I think they see that. But Ed, what are your thoughts? No, I, I had some of my thoughts. It, you know, it, it's a useful program, but what's the exit strategy out of that program? That, that, that's really what I, I think the problem is. Um, I, I wanted to just quickly comment on the, the rate situation, and I know we're looking at that in a, um, you know, just an hour or so, um, and you know, some good comments already, but you know, I'm not only looking at the rate, um, but the comments that uh, Jay Powell's gonna make. And I think you know, he's been talked about here as you know, really um, you know, needing to walk and chew gum at the same time. So conduct monetary policy, and conduct financial stability. Um, and the question is, what does he signal about the rate profile um, over time? And also what does he signal about um, the uh, uh, financial stability actions that have been taken and potentially that are still on the table? So that, that to me is um, gonna be the interesting part. You know, John, uh, I, just one more piece on the uh, BTFP, um, we just rewind couple of years, again, recency of experience, right? Rewind a couple of years to TARP. And while right now it won't be published until 2025, who's taking advantage of BTFP, uh, there could be a stigma associated with that, uh, like there was with TARP. TARP was a great program. It's a phenomenal program, very well designed. But a year later, investors started looking at the banks that took TARP and started penalizing them saying, well, you had to take TARP, so there must be problems. Um, but who wouldn't have taken TARP? And I think there's a similar, there could be a similar stigma here that again, based on recency experience, some banks may shy away from it when the discount window is already available to them. Chris, are the regionals taking advantage of this? I think they are. And I think we'll cite, we'll have more details in the days ahead. You know, a lot of regionals have not discussed openly what they are and aren't doing and what they are and are seeing, you know, back to the deposit question earlier. I feel as we get into early April, we're going to get a lot more color. Um, a handful of big banks report uh, shortly after Easter, approximately the 13th and 14th. And I think we'll have a, uh, a lot of information by that time. And some may actually give interim updates on some of these points in the first couple of days of April. So I think there's more coming soon. You know, Chris, you touched on the differences between 2008 to 2010, the, the original global financial crisis. Um, I think um, what's unique about this situation is, at least from the general economy, I mean, it's obviously not good. I mean, we certainly don't want a banking crisis, but it's not clear to me how much this will affect the real economy. I mean, if I'm a business owner and I don't feel safe with uh, one of these banks in the news, and I pull my money out and I stick it in Bank of America or Chase, does that necessarily change my behavior? Uh, it may not. On the other hand, if I'm moving my money, I might be fearful. I might be less likely to buy that building I've been thinking about. And my banker might be less willing to lend me money at 80%. They may come back at 70%. So I think it's going to have an impact on the economy. I'm just not sure. And I think that's the big difference between 2008, in my view, is it was very clear in the global financial crisis, we were gonna be in a recession for a while. 
Um, whereas in this financial crisis, it's unclear. Anyone else want to chime in? Well, I think Ed's comments that he made earlier really resonate here in terms of, you know, we have the too big to fail, the $250 billion threshold. Uh, and while, John, I think your, your comments are, are spot on in terms of the general economy, you know, I, I look at a comparison of, of 08 to now in, in the banking world, and I say, what's different? I mean, 08 brought a whole slew of regulations. Is this going to bring a whole slew of regulations or, or bolt-on regulations? And, you know, the question is, are they going to put in more safety nets? Are they going to start looking at uh, deposit concentrations by business type, uninsured deposits? I know this was mentioned earlier. Are they going to lower that threshold? And are they going to do that in combination with increases in FDI insur FDIC insurance to try to balance this out? Because you can obviously see that if you lower the threshold for capital and liquidity ratios, and you start maybe, let's put it back $50 billion, and then you say, no, we're not raising FDIC insurance, people might say, this is a big enough issue, I'm gonna move all my deposits around. And so you have these big companies banking at, you know, unrealistically, but banking at 50 banks, and suddenly you have all these smaller banks as systemic banks, because if one company fails and takes, it could take out a lot more banks. So it, I think it's this balancing act, and I don't know how they're gonna respond to it, but I do think there's gonna be some bolt-on regulations here. Yeah, I, have, I certainly have thoughts on regulation, and um, I, I think we can expect uh, more on that. I think, you know, one of the questions, you know, and we touched on, you know, our, uh, I think, John, you had said, you know, are we perhaps in a little more stable environment now? You know, are there more shoes to drop out there? You know, what happens? And uh, obviously, we don't have crystal balls, um, you know, to, to um, predict that. But, you know, a lot of that would... Um, determine perhaps is there further deposit flight and deposit flight from smaller banks to some of the money center type banks. And I think, you know, studies have shown that um, community banks, especially in regional banks, um, are, are more active in terms of their uh, lending and, and supporting small businesses in their footprint. And, and that's really why they're there to, um, you know, work with the business, you know, community in their um, in, in their area, in their network, they, they know them better, they're able, more detailed information, they're better able to assess them as borrowers and to make um, loans, you know, good loans, as opposed to, you know, larger um, bank that, you know, the loan officers may not be, um, you know, nearby and relying more on, you know, financial data without understanding, you know, the business in the same way. So, if that happens, if that deposit flight happens, you know, we could start to see some erosion um, of the, um, you know, vitality of uh, small and mid-sized businesses if they're not supported in the same way um, from their bankers. So, you know, we'll see how that all plays out, but that could certainly be um, one outcome of this. Yeah, I think the chatter will die down when the chatter about a bank that's on the watch list doesn't result in their ending. Um, if First Republic, for example, survives this, um, then no one's talking about who's next. And you know we're probably a week or so away before we get that. But that's where I think this ends, when um, there is no shoe to drop and we go a week or two weeks without another rescue. Every day without a bank failure is a good day. So I absolutely agree with John. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, as far as the, the regional banks, I mean, I, Chris, I'll ask your opinion on this. I mean, it sounds like uh, they got what they wanted with the 2018 Dodd-Frank reform. They got this exemption from stress tests. Uh, unfortunately, though, it does seem like that was turned against them. And uh, the market uh, unfairly began to perceive the regionals as being less regulated. And um, the success they had legislatively ended up um, backfiring. What are your thoughts on that, Chris? 
Well, I think that's true, John. But as our parents all told us growing up, life isn't fair. Um, you know, banks do have regulated leverage. They can lever 12 to 1, as I was saying at the beginning. And I think the cost of that leverage is regulation. Um, you know, banks really fouled up on their contingent liquidity. And the contingent liquidity uh, at Silicon Valley was uh, just really poor. And they did not handicap uh, a big outflow of deposits, nor did I think that they ever think that it would happen. Um, there's always a little bit of hubris involved in these things. And I, I, I can tell you because we covered Silicon Valley, there was plenty there. I just don't think they thought this was an outcome. And, um, you know, I'm uh, my Monday morning quarterbacking is that the industry would have been better off parking excess money at the Fed. It would have worked a lot smoother. They could have pulled it out very quickly. They didn't have to mark to market. And honestly, as interest rates rose, you would have been paid handsomely and frankly had better returns from Fed funds at the Fed uh, than you would have buying securities largely below 2% when those securities were purchased in late 21, early 22. But it's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback, as we all know. So, Jason, do you think the, there will be changes in how deposits are valued on banks' balance sheets and how it impacts their regulatory capital? Well, you know, I'm going to get into that a little bit, you know, talk about M&A, but I can talk about it now. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, if you're bullish, you say, yeah, the regulators are going to start looking at deposit concentration the same way they might examine a bank's loan concentration. Um, you know, it, it's not inconceivable. Certainly from a valuation standpoint, uh, you know, if you're going to start as a basis at looking at a bank based on its tangible common equity, which already takes out the securities uh, and any discount on AOCI from that, um, I think as a further analysis to the, you know, the quote unquote value of that bank, I think people are going to start looking at a how, what's the percentage of the uninsured deposits? What, what uh, uh, concentration of depositors do you have in terms of not just are they core deposits versus, you know, hot deposits or CDs? It's what industry are your customers in? Are those relationship customers that also have a loan with you? Are they just, you know, uh, just a depositor that's putting excess cash with you? I think you're going to start looking at all of that and get to that level of granularity, um, you know, to determine the true health of a bank. John, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of kind of three top line things to think about from a regulatory standpoint. Um, one, and I think Chris touched on this, is related to that, um, you know, thresholds. And there are thresholds embedded in Dodd-Frank. Originally, they were amended in um, 2018. The uh, um, was actually bipartisan legislation at the time, although now it's like everything become, um, you know, politicized. Um, and then in 2019, the, the Fed actually then issued regulation it called tailoring to adjust those thresholds. And that's where you know, between that legislation and regulation, the 50 threshold largely moved up to 250. That, that I think is really needs to be examined. It doesn't make sense if in the heat of the battle, uh, the regulators have determined that a 200 billion and a $100 billion institution are systemically important. That 250 in my mind is not viable. Now, is there, you know, the political will to um, get something through Congress on that? Um, I think it's unclear. There's been some early calls for that, um, but you know we'll see more action on that. The um, regulators and the Fed can do some things themselves in terms of increasing uh, regulation for the mid-sized banks. Um, however, um, some actions uh, would take legislation. So I think that'll that'll play out due to the legislative need. It'll play out probably in a messy way with hearings and um, over some time. Uh, the next area that I expect. Um, to be some action is around um, merger reviews um, by the regulators, and they need to approve um, bank mergers. And if you're talking about um, some of the perhaps large communities, super communities, um, regionals, and um, you know, adding uh, assets of similar sized institutions, do they start to get into that um, area where this threshold, if you will, which as I've talked about is a little unclear what it is exactly now, but this threshold uh, comes into play. And so um, merger reviews may actually become um, much more stringent in terms of looking at them, their footprint. It actually gives the regulators pretty much license to look at um, you know, both the acquiring and acquirer institution. And then the last area of um, regulatory action, and again, this can happen absent any legislation is through uh, regulatory exams, and I expect a really significantly beefed up 
um, examination process, both in individual exams and perhaps for some uh, what are called like horizontal exams across the industry. But um, you look at what's gone down and we have really kind of a, a potpourri of issues, you know, to look at um, liquidity and funding, um, you know, governance, the role of the board, um, you know, the role of the chief risk officer, uh, perhaps the information flows, um, deposit concentrations, the even the business model. Um, there, there's many, many things there that the regulators could sink their teeth on. And I expect during exam cycles that um, all of those areas will be scrutinized. So those are a few things from me in terms of, you know, what to look forward to. You know, Ed, John, just real quick, Ed, touching on your point about merger reviews, uh, I can attest as I'm an A counsel for banks that um, two years ago, you'd submit a pro forma and it was almost an afterthought. Now I'm exaggerating a little, but it was almost an afterthought. And starting about uh, pretty definitively, it was a pretty bright line, starting about July, June or July of last year, uh, we didn't have a single deal where the regulators did not otherwise come back with a significant number of comments really drilling down into the performance. So the regulators, to their credit, uh, you know, are sort of already on top of that from the, from the merger review. Of course, we don't like to say that because we're trying to usher these deals through quickly with our clients, but I mean, to their credit, it is something they've already started paying attention to and are, I think are very cognizant of. You know, Chris, as a bank analyst, uh, aren't you effectively marking the securities portfolio to market with respect to capital. I'm just curious, is as the as the market doing this anyway with respect to the unrealized losses in these bank security portfolios? So John, I'll give you a standard uh, analyst answer. It depends. If you are available for sale, then it was already getting marked to tangible capital already for years and years. If it was held to maturity, it wasn't. In fact, one of the bank CEOs on TV last week called it hide to maturity, and I think that's a fair use of the H uh, acronym. Um, you know, the accounting rules do not force that to mark to market. We're kind of back to mark to market issues, just like we were in 2007 leading into 2008, and it's sort of back to what is the right mark. Um, I think the next piece of this puzzle is actually doing loan marks and trying to address loan marks as it pertains to how stocks are valued. Uh, that's a little bit tricky, um, but that's kind of where the uh, where the community is heading as we sit here this afternoon. So unfortunately, um, you know, we are, but we there's still more work to be done as tried the mark to market. Now that's going to work both ways too, because there are certain parts of the balance sheet that have to get marked up uh, because of their inherent value, and uh, that's always an academic. Uh, struggle for some investors too. One of the uh, questions we got was any sense of exposure um, to banks, to Credit Suisse corporate bonds and their securities portfolio? And, you know, would that be a meaningful exposure given the $18 billion or so losses that they took? Anyone have any color on that? I'll take a stab at it. I think it's highly unlikely. Um, if you look at the call report data, and we have all of it for both available for sale and um, held to maturity, there's very little corporate bonds in there. And then when you do have a corporate bond, it's really rare that somebody would take um, you know, a big position in something. So I'm sure it's somewhere probably housed in some of the big top 10 banks, but I would imagine it's a de minimis issue. I think the question was going to be on some of the trading desks of your big uh, systemically important banks. Did they have have, um, you know, trades to Credit Suisse uh, the past 10, 20 days, and, you know, were some of those unwound? Did they have swaps and counterparty issues? Some of those may happen. Um, I suspect we'll get that all cleaned out in some of the one-time charges and Q1 earnings. I don't expect it to wreck uh, or coily earnings for anybody, but I think uh, you could see a one-time charge here or there or net it against otherwise a profitable trading month in the month of March. Uh, first question, are there restrictions to the use of funds at banks that apply for the BTFB? Ed, do you want to tackle that? Or Jason? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any, but um, others might. No, I, I, my understanding is it works just like the, the normal discount window. In fact, it's kind of like the discount window, just with like a, a slight modification to how the normal discount window works. Good time for another poll question. Uh, please bring up the question with respect to lending. A uh, big question uh, we have is, what impact do you think the recent events will have on lending within your institution? No change, increased lending, moderately reduced lending, significantly reduced lending. To give you an example while this question's coming up, uh, Signature Bank, 
um, was a very active lender in New York commercial real estate. Uh, so, you know, obviously you lose a lender in that space. Um, there might be less credit. Um, so looks looks like for most most panelists here, 59% said no change. Uh, a third said they would moderately reduce lending. 6% said significantly reduce lending. Um, so it seems like lending, at least within this panel, is either going to is going to be reduced slightly, or there'll be uh, moderately reduced lending. With respect to winners and losers, um, who are who are the winners and losers of this uh, banking crisis? Well, uh, maybe I'll jump in. You know, and I I hate to say um, you know winners in a crisis because I, I think we all have some impact from that. But, um, you know, we talked about deposit flows and potentially deposit flows going to uh, large money centers. Um, you know, they may actually be increasing, um, you know, their proportion of deposits as a result of this. Um, you know, and again, I hate to necessarily call them winners, um, but I think some of the startups and tech firms, um, you know, their deposits were in effect, um, you know, bailed out um, through the actions and um, perhaps, you know, you could judge if that's winning or not, but, um, you know, it could have been much worse. Um, losers, I, I think there is a long and distinguished list and, um, you know, I can probably only get to some of them. Um, you know, you touched on Credit Suisse, um, you know, there was a particular type of bond that they issued um, called an AT1 um, or, you um, you know, additional tier one capital, also called a, a COCO. Um, it's got other names for it. Um, those bondholders are losers. And um, those provisions were um, defined in the prospectus. Um, you can argue whether it was appropriate or not, but um, they, they've really been, you know, wiped out. So um, clearly they're on that list. Um, I have also on my list, um, you know, our overall ability and by the regulators to manage and control moral hazard, um, you know, every time there's, you know, some type of action, especially ad hoc actions, um, I think it increases moral hazard um, in the system. Um, you know, another area, um, you know, of concern that's emerged is around, you know, mortgage-backed securities and mortgage-backed securities valuation. And I, I think people are starting to become more concerned um, you know, about those assets, their valuation and, and such. Um, you know, I think the um, lighter touch regulation, um, you know, is a loser as well. And, um, you know, certainly, you know, there's going to be much studying and revisiting on, um, you know, on the regulatory structure. Um, but, you know, the view of a lighter touch regulation, I think is, you know, that that's, that's definitely a loser. I could probably go on with a few others, but um, those are some of the top ones. I'll give you one loser. Um, I, I, if you look at the board of directors of Silicon Valley Bank, they did not have one real banker on their board. There was an investment banker. As much as I love investment bankers, they're a different type of banker. Um, I think every bank in the country should have a retired or current commercial banker on their board of directors that is not affiliated with the management of the bank. I think that's a very good idea and a very good reform. Jason, winners or losers? Yeah, I mean, I think SVB, uh, their board and, and their executive staff, clearly losers. Um, but I, I just say that in the personal sense. It, you know, generally speaking, if you talk about the, the, the greater banking you know, market as a whole, um, you know, I think we could have a whole slew of, of losers here. If, and I'd, I couldn't fully understand, Ed, if you meant that the the prior lighter touch regulation is a loser, or if they stay with a lighter touch, that's a, a loser. Both. I mean, oh, okay. you know, it, 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 it's it's a failure in hindsight, and you know there will be a clamp down going forward. Yeah, you know, and I, I look at um, you know for the vast majority of of the banks in the United States, which are your community banks, um, you know, I look at them if that's the result, if that the result is going to be greater regulation, greater restrictions on capital and liquidity without a very high threshold. Um, you know, I look at the community banks as being the losers. It, it brings a whole slew of additional regulation that these banks don't need and don't deserve because, you know, they're relationship banks, they're community banks that know their customers. I don't think they, they are in a position that they would experience such a run that, that SVB did. Um, you know, and I, and I, 
And if they bring additional regulations like deposit concentration analyses, um, the winner I see is credit unions. Because if the NCUA doesn't impose similar uh, you know, restrictions on deposit concentration, you can certainly play this out in terms of M&A and transactions and see how uh, banks who are looking to acquire other banks for strategic reasons are gonna start looking at that deposit concentration, do that deposit analysis, and there may be restrictions that the FDIC puts on uninsured deposits and other things that makes that deal a less worthwhile deal or more expensive deal versus a credit union who's already, you know, winning out a lot of these transactions for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to get into here. Um, but I see them then as the resultant winners and possibly a drive towards M&A on the credit union side, uh, acquiring banks. So Jason, you mentioned M&A when we chatted a few weeks ago. You said that... Um... You're working on a number of M&A transactions and some of them may not happen now. I mean, to extend you give some color, are you seeing M&A slow down completely? Well, you saved those transactions. Um, so they, they are happening, uh, but um, yeah, I have seen a slowdown uh, in announced or inquisitive uh, buyers or, or sellers. Um, and I think that's probably gonna continue here. Um, you know, I think that all the, not I think, I know, all the recent deals that have been coming in are all priced on tangible common equity. Okay, they're not based on on, on regulatory or, or common equity. It's tangible common equity, um, which factors in these uh, AOCI losses. Um, so one of the things that I think is going to start coming into the system when you're negotiating these deals is either caps and floors on what those AOCI losses are, because right now it's in, it's a very volatile. Uh, market in terms of pricing, and that can swing your pricing on a deal when you're closing based on the day uh, in what those uh, those that portfolio has to be marked to uh, when you actually you know con consummate the deal because then it has to be marked. Um, so you know I do think that volatility is going to introduce a slowdown in M and A activity unless of course it speeds up because we have additional regulations and banks you know are interested in a position where they they're not going to be able to solve their issues in the near term. Yeah, we have a few more minutes. So if you have any questions, send them in. Um, while you're doing that, I'm going to ask Chris Marinak, um, winners, losers, and thoughts on bank M&A with respect to what's happened recently. So I'm going to take the other side of Jason's comments on credit union. I'm going to say the credit unions are losers because at some point we're going to realize that the credit unions have such an amazing tax benefit, and there are a lot of dollars that can be struck from that. And I know they're very strong politically, but um, I think a couple ticking time bombs in, in real estate lending that already exist today uh, in the uh, the credit unions are, are going to be the the trigger. So it might be a 24, 25, or 26 time frame, but I think it will happen, and I think. It it, uh, and this is going to cause a re-examination of why we have given uh, all these tax goodies to the credit unions. Um, if they were clean lenders, they probably could skate by, but I don't think that's the case. I think there are already some examples out there that are festering in commercial real estate that I think will come to the surface. Yeah, just real quick, you know, kind of follow-up to that is, John, you know, a lot of the credit unions are acquiring banks. I mean, it's, it's obvious that, that credit unions do not have the expertise and experience that, you know, regulated FDIC institutions do. Um, and when they acquire those portfolios, oftentimes the bankers that, that manage those don't stay on. And I do think that, that Chris is 100% right, that there are issues percolating there that are going to cause a, a serious problem because they just don't have the sophistication that banks do. Yeah, one of the questions uh, it has been, been covered, but let's, we'll, we'll, we'll tackle it again. Um, do you anticipate M&A pricing to take into account HCM losses in the future? I mean, it sounds like, Jason, what you're saying is it's, it's being taken into account uh, anyway. At least in pricing of M&A, yeah. I mean, everyone's going off tangible common equity right now. They're, they're taking it completely into account. Got it. Um, Chris, any thoughts on M&A? I mean, uh, you know the the regional banks are, are are clearly being pushed to acquire some of these uh, these two uh, struggling banks or failed banks. Um, what are you hearing on the M and A front? 
Well, I think we'll have a resolution on Silicon Valley in the next couple of days, and obviously we have part of the assets um, for signature pledged to New York Community. I think New York Community can do a lot with that, and I think so can the bank who acquires Silicon Valley. So I think there's opportunities there. I think in terms of the rest of the Joneses, um, once we know where companies are in terms of their capital needs and sort of liquidity needs with the um, first quarter results, I think there is going to be a push for more M&A. But honestly, just like it was in 2010 and 11, it's a positive for the surviving companies. There are companies who are doing just fine or not seeing deposit runs, but this whole episode has stressed them out and they will exit. Um, they don't have general plans uh, for succession and they are going to sell anyways. They're just going to accelerate the time frame. That's going to be, I think, a very positive. You know, there was a transaction um, that we were part of uh, with a bank in Illinois purchasing a bank in Wisconsin yesterday, and I think more of those uh, will start to happen. So that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. So I do think it will happen. I, I agree with Jason's comments on M&A. I think we'll see more of it, and I think it will be at all kinds of sizes. Um, remember that the regulators are struggling to approve big bank deals. Uh, we're seeing that with the TD uh, First Horizon transaction that's still lingering in its uh, second year now of waiting. And then I think at the smaller state level, the community bank deals tend to happen a lot faster. They're a little slower, but they are still getting approved. Got it. Um, well, um, we're at our time limit. Um, anyone want to give any closing thoughts that uh, they haven't covered so far? Thank you, John, for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, if anyone has questions offline, just please reach out. Uh, like, likewise, thank, thanks, John, and thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, great discussion. Hey, gentlemen, well, that you. was fabulous. Thank you very much. Uh, in the hand in the dashboard, there is the handout and the contact information. If you need Joseph, can you throw up a email address for John Winnick there? Um, you should have John's email or send it to me, Bob at calmreport.com. Any other questions, we'll be happy to get them to the appropriate. Yeah, we'll also send everyone the copy of the presentation, uh, the recorded copy as well. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. Um, very good, John. Go ahead and close it out. Everyone, uh, everything's going to be all right. Um, we're going through a couple <laughs> rocky weeks, but um, you know, banks are sitting at in a very good position. There's uh, the vast majority of banks are well capitalized. Most deposits are uninsured. Um, we're going to have some stress, but uh, nothing we we can't handle. Um, with that, um, well, John, let me interrupt you. We were talking. Are you going to do a follow up on this in a couple of weeks or a month? What What are your thoughts? Uh, I think um, we'll certainly put out a survey, but I think this was a great panel and oh, it was excellent. We should, awesome. we should do this again. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. This concludes the webinar. <laughs>